And everyone, Tyler Pyburn here of the Pulse Network, and welcome into CMS Connect, the web content management industry's only news commentary show. I'm glad you guys could join us. We've got a great show for you lined up today here out of Boston where it's very muggy indeed, but it's okay because we're indoors and we're talking about personalization. Yes, all about that experience, how to personalize a website visitor's entire experience and hoping to help us navigate through this entire experience itself. As always, we welcome to my left, Scott Lewer, Principal and President Analyst, excuse me, President and Principal Sorry, Analyst man. at Digital Clarity Group. Welcome in, Scott. How are you doing today? Chief picker-upper. Yeah, I'm good, man. Yeah. I think it's great. <laughs> so we, we've got a good show lined up for everybody today. We've got a lot of great yeah. guests, a lot of great content we're going to be uh, talking about today. Yeah, I'm really excited to have Tim in the studio. He's a, you know, he's a great guy and he's a really smart guy, so we're going to, I think that should be a great segment. And to have Seth in here as well in person, we got everybody in the house today. It's going to be awesome. Absolutely. Del definitely going to be a great show. So he mentioned right there, we do have a good cast of so kind of give you guys an idea of who we're going to be talking to. Tim Walters, Digital Clarity Group. He's going to be in studio in just a few moments. As well as Seth Gottlieb uh, from Linebridge. He's going to be in the uh, spotlight just a little bit later on. We're going to be reviewing the OpenText ECM platform, uh, formerly known as Vignette. So that is our topics of discussion today. However, we also have to thank our sponsors who make this entire show happen and worthwhile and really put on a great show. They do a great job at doing so. We have to thank first Falcon Software. Now Falcon provides creative design, e-commerce, web content management, social and mobile solutions for organizations across the globe. We also would like to thank Digital Clarity Group, DCG, is a research and advisory firm focused on navigating organizations through the digital transformation process. Also, while we're on this topic right now, I'd like to recommend that at some point throughout the show, probably after the show, as soon as it's over, make sure to scroll just below the video player itself and go ahead and download the latest white paper on website personalization. Like I said, located at the bottom of your screen, it is a great read. You're going to want to take a look at that for sure. All right, but we have to kick things off, and the way we always do it is by starting with the news. So the very first topic we're going to go ahead and touch upon today, Scott, is all about Tumblr, and is it going to be a, a CMS powerhouse? Now, it's always been kind of that blogging platform, but you know, immediately following the news of Yahoo's Tumblr takeover, which is what a lot of folks about, were buzzing about actually on l last month's episode, uh, the company actually released, released a statement via its official blog saying, quote, we promise not to screw it up. I like the way they put that. We will operate Tumblr independently. David Karp will remain CEO, the product roadmap, their team, their wit, reverence, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera is going to be doing exactly what they deserve, so on and so forth. So with that in mind, Scott, let me ask you this. Despite having a lot of obstacles to overcome, can it actually become a player in the CMS industry, honestly? Or is it, is it truly just another blogger, if you will? Yeah, so I think if it becomes a player in the CMS industry, two things would have to happen. Number one, it would have to become a CMS. And number two, Yahoo would have to do something that it's never done before, which is to build the CMS. So. Um, could it? Maybe so, but let, let's talk through what Tumblr is today and kind of what this does. Um, so I think it was $1.3 million that, uh, one, three, sorry, billion, $1.3 billion, billion, dollars, it was, it was billion dollar uh, that Yahoo uh, spent to acquire Tumblr. Mm -hmm. um, Tumblr is you know, an extremely popular tool. It's uh, got 113 million active blogs on it. There are 52 billion individual posts on it with 300 million monthly unique visitors. That's a lot of attention, mm -hmm. and I think that is what... Uh, Yahoo was trying to buy, and you know. Uh, well, it's almost that. I mean, yeah. for me, Yahoo tried to dip their toes into the social sphere at, at one point in time. They failed miserably. I think this is just another attempt from the social side. I don't necessarily know if it's going to be, you know, trying to rival WordPress in a sense. I think they're really saying, hey. We want to have a social side to us, and this is it. Yeah, I think this is, you know, in, in all due respect to Mike Johnson, who wrote the report. Mike, Mike wrote a great article on, you know, on this piece, the one that you referenced yep. uh, in CMS uh, Critic. Critic. Yep. Um, and it's a great job, but I think it's that maybe it's what's happened here is that WordPress has officially been accepted as a CMS platform, and so there's nothing to discuss anymore. So let's talk about the next is it or isn't <laughs> it a CMS? Um, you know, I, look at it. I mean, is it a social tool? Absolutely. Is it a microblogging platform? Absolutely. What would it have to do to become a CMS? There's an awful lot of room to run between here and there. I think the bigger question, though, is will they do what Mayer says they won't do, which is screw it up? I mean, they bought, yeah. they bought well, Flickr. Well, that's the biggie. They is bought Flickr. Just, yeah. How relevant is Flickr now? They bought uh, D Delicious. Who does social bookmarking on Delicious anymore? I mean, it's just yeah. um, so far they kind of have screwed it up. Now, not under her 
direction necessarily. And she's making, I think I saw an article the other day that said that they have laid off or, or either natural through natural attrition or th that she has axed and laid off like a thousand employees. And yeah. quite frankly, that's probably quite um, appropriate <laughs> yeah. given the things that I've read about the kind of the Yahoo uh, environment uh, internally and kind of the way that they worked and, and that sort of thing. Um, I don't think there was a, you know, tons of drive over there yeah. to, be, to be number one. She obviously has that though and is willing to spend $1.3 billion and a lot more mm -hmm. to um, get themselves there. So I think what they bought here was some attention and what they bought was you know, a base of users and fan base, albeit a lot of 14 year old girls posting pictures of themselves, but regardless, it's, <laughs> whatever. they're but trying they, to be but relevant, again, I mean, I just not in the CNS world. We, we could talk about, you know, Yahoo on Business Wire or yeah. whatever that yeah, was. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, they've got cash. They can swing no and miss, so they have the ability to do that. This is, I think, in my opinion, just another swing at the ball so. in a sense. Exactly. So, we'll see what happens for yeah. them. But I, let's not have the CMS or not CMS discussion. <laughs> well, because it is a CMS show, we have to bring uh, it. Up you know, I get it. I get it. Fair enough. All right, let's go ahead and let's move on. We're going to go ahead and we're going to talk about uh, SAP. You now, after a repeated, uh, a couple different false starts of trying to build its way into enterprise e commerce space. Uh, SAP finally decided to actually make a, somewhat of a U-turn in a sense uh, on its strategy and you know buy its way in, which you know a lot of companies their size have a tendency to do so. For years, there has been uh, intense speculation that SAP might acquire, uh, I believe it's pronounced Hybris. Correct you me if I'm wrong. Okay. Uh, and, and behind the scenes, there has certainly been you know a lot of umming and ahhing over the enterprise software giant's uh, e-commerce e strategy. Good move for SAP. I mean, what's your thoughts on this? Yeah, we we know. Um, SAP fairly well as a credit group, right? And um, there's been a lot of speculation about who would SAP buy, and I've, I've speculated myself here on the show yeah. in the past. Um, and the question there was, is who, who will they buy to make an entry into the CMS space? Which CMS vendor will they buy? Um, but regardless, the, the, what the, what the, the point that we kind of knew about what SAP was going to do is try to become relevant in this kind of customer experience world, in this CEM paradigm that we're talking about now. Um, and that we've described many times on the show and we'll talk again to today. But um, so the question wasn't whether they were gonna come you know, hard and try to play in this space. It was about kind of in which way did they do that first, I think. Um, and the purchase of Hybris um, is surprising, I think, in a number of, for a number of reasons. Um, number one is there was wide speculation um, that Adobe was going to be buying Hybris, yeah. to be honest. Uh, I think there were an awful lot of uh, folks let down uh, there over. I think I, I have a feeling, I don't know inside stuff necessarily, uh, but that this was an 11th hour deal. Um, mm -hmm. And probably, you know, guided quite a bit by, you know, Hybris has got a lot of VC backing, and so I have a yep. feeling they decided exactly what portfolio they want this to sit in. Well, what's interesting with SAP right now is I know that they're shifting their focus a little bit more so, putting a little more emphasis on the, the customer experience side. So I think this, I mean, they, they've always been about that, but you know, as they've pivoted a little bit more towards that industry, yeah. this kind of falls in, in line with that. Was I saying the wrong thing? Because that's, that's what I meant to be talking about, was that the folks that were making the CEM switch was going to be SAP. The question was kind of how they did it, whether they bought a WCM player first. I think I've speculated either open text or uh, you know, core media would be yeah. on their, on their, in their go, sites. Yeah. Um, but, the, but, but instead, they kind of came at it from the commerce side, and let's go there. Now, the reason that I didn't predict that was because they, they had a platform. Right? They yeah. had a commerce platform they had built themselves. The challenge with that commerce platform was it was heavily integrated and fully dependent on their CRM platform that they had. Yeah. So therefore, they couldn't. it was very difficult to go add net new customers and bring in net new customers because as we talk about, in that large enterprise world, you have to be able to kind of play and work with other systems, right? That kind of enterprise space is very heterogeneous. And so you can't depend on folks already having uh, this SAP CRM platform. Yeah. They wanted to be able to bring in net new folks. So, so let that me ask sense. you, I mean, do, do you like it? Do you, are, do you like the move? Um, I, I definitely like them. Yeah. I mean, Hybris has gone. I mean, they've been oh, on, they've been it, it, soaring. Was looking at it too, so that, that, means, that has to give you a little idea. Hybris has been hot. I mean, for yeah. four straight quarters, they've had great earnings, um, mm -hmm. lots and lots and lots of sold license revenue. Don't ask me the numbers, but they've really been selling well. Um, they're in every conversation today. Um, uh, commerce and just the worlds of commerce and CEM, it's obviously a big play. They needed to also keep up with SAP did with the likes of Oracle and IBM because they really were losing to them from that from the commerce perspective there. So it's great for SAP. I think it's great for hybrid to be in that play. You know, where does that leave an Adobe or somebody else? Certainly everybody's got to step up. I think we're yep. going to now start to see these commerce acquisitions more and more 
yeah. um, by other other players in the space. I still think though they're missing a large part of that CEM portfolio though, which is WCM player. So yeah. you know we'll see what happens there. But um, I, I expect more acquisitions from SAP in the future, not less. Excellent. Great. All right, let, let's move on to the uh, the next news item of, uh, of the day, and that is not necessarily talking about an acquisition, but more of a partnership, specifically between Acquia as well as Alfresco. Now, on June 18th, uh, Brian Ruby, who we've seen here on CMS Connected, also from CMS Report, wrote a post uh, on Alfresco and Acquia's strategic partnership announcement to deliver the business critical content application to their customers. Now, the announcement of the partnership is, is a little unsurprising move in a sense for most involved in the you know in the open source community. Uh, however, Scott, you know it's probably the first time we've actually seen Acquia and Alfresco really so publicly announce such a partnership for delivering products, services, and, and perhaps this is you know recognition that customers have a need for better integration solutions in both products and yeah. services, right? Yeah, I think you know. So they're coming out really strongly and forming this partnership in yep. a way. It's it's also um, a point to make that um, Tom Erickson made in his announcement. Tom Erickson being the CEO of of of, uh, of Acquia, mm -hmm. um, that actually Alfresco has relaunched its platform on the on the Drupal platform. Their their own website, frankly. So they're they're kind of all in on that. It's not uncommon for Alfresco to make these sorts of relationships to create these sorts of relationships with others in the you know web content management ecosystem. This largely due to the fact that it was about maybe two years ago or so that Alfresco kind of decided to, you know, kind of officially put out that they are not a web CMS platform, right? That they have a great document management platform and underlying architecture for so things they like They went out of their way to yeah. make sure that was known. Yeah, and it wasn't for a long time. There was yeah. a lot of ambiguity there, and that was one of yeah. the things that I kind of criticized them for, and they basically said, this is one thing that we are not, right, yep. which is great, which allowed them to start forming some very specific partnerships. Um, Rivet Logic being one of them, I, I think we have something about them a little bit later in the show, I'm not sure, but Rivet Logic was a um, services provider partner um, who actually built a CMS on top of, it's called Crafter Software, just, just recently spun off yep. um, on the Alfresco platform as a web, web content management player. That seems to be, you know, one alternative now that they're not all in on because here they have this other one for basically the same purpose, the same um, idea where they're working with the Drupal platform and working with the Acquia folks. Um, so point is, they want to be relevant. There is a there is a big uh, play there to happen where to have your enterprise content and documents and that sort of yep. stuff, and and to have that start to merge with your out. Go your uh, your the perspective that others have of you, the, your interaction with your customers, your interactions with your prospects. That bringing some of that content to life externally for the outside world, it's more than just web content now that we're starting to do. We're creating this ecosystem of providing these web experiences that not only include web content solely created for things like marketing, but also depending on a lot of that internal enterprise information that you can you know that you can. I'm publish. interested in your, your thoughts. I mean, for Acquia's sake, it seems like this is just a, another piece in their toolkit in a sense too, isn't it? I mean, it's just, I mean, from the open source side, yeah. for them to go ahead and say, hey, we are your one-stop shop, that they continue to add tools to their arsenal, don't they? They really do. Um, and, and they're really starting to productize in ways that they weren't yeah. necessarily before. Arco is, you know, heavily a services organization doing things like, you know, hosting your Drupal sites and su providing supports and that sort of stuff. And now more and more, I mean, they've always had kind of their SaaS play in, in Drupal Gardens, but it didn't get a lot of attention. They're putting a lot more you know, oomph behind that now, these other product relationships. So I think they're starting to really um, kind of productize in more ways than just uh, being a services company. All right, well, let's move on. We're going to touch upon the, the very last news item of the day. And that's actually going to be bringing up Ektron. So uh, another vendor really making news this month is, in fact, Ektron, because you know, they recently debuted uh, version 9, uh, I believe. Oh, excuse me. You know what? Scott, you're stopping me. I'm jumping ahead. I have a tendency to do that. I get excited sometimes. Excited. I jump Calm ahead. down. It's early. I, I, it's always whenever I look up and I see the look on Scott's face, like, Tyler, no. Move back. So we're going to move oh, back, but I apologize for that. So we're going to go ahead. Though. That we're was We're going to talk about Salesforce, <laughs> all right? Because they actually hired their uh, former Oracle executive uh, and acquires uh, Extract, ex, excuse me, Exact Target. Mm -hmm. uh, interest developments coming out of uh, Salesforce of, of late with hiring of Keith Block, former Oracle executive, uh, as its president and vice chairman, and the exact target acquisition spending close to three and a half billion in the process. That's a big chunk of dough. Uh, they really wanted exact target, didn't they? They did. I think they spent two and a half billion, but regardless of whether it was three and a half or two and a half, they paid an awful lot of money for this, and they definitely wanted. And you know, the question really here is, um, 
<laughs> no. The, we, we knew for a fact that sales, not for a fact, but we knew, it was wide speculation that Salesforce was going to be entering in the space of marketing automation. Um, I think many of us, myself included, speculated that um, it was going to be more like a Marketo as the, as the acquisition, but when Marketo went IPO and they pushed out, I don't know if that changed things, if they actually went out because of they, they knew that Salesforce was looking a little bit of a different direction. I don't think many expected the exact target acquisition, but it certainly was a good one. I mean, it certainly is a well-reputed market marketing automation uh, product in the space. And it does a lot um, in terms of pushing Benioff kind of really where he wanted to go. Um, he said this will be his last acquisition for a while. <laughs> do you believe that? I was that? Gonna say, how often have we heard that? Business? Yeah, do you believe that? I don't know. Uh, you know, maybe he's being sincere. Maybe it's because he wants to finally integrate all these products, which it takes an awful long time to do and he hasn't done yet. Um, I mean, we're a salesforce.com customer and I don't have access to any of the tools they've bought. So, um, <laughs> but no, I mean, it takes a lot to integrate these things. So there's one thing to say about, let, let's go get our house in order and kind of, kind of capitalize on the products that we've acquired. That takes some housekeeping. And so maybe he slows down because of that. I still think though that they also, that you know, he also misses the chance here if he doesn't go acquire a true WCM player. I mean, yeah. you. I, I think to believe that Sites.com, which is their homegrown um, web content management system they've got, I mean, it's really, I mean, it's less, I mean, it might, <laughs> If we consider it a web content management system, maybe Yahoo does have a web content management system. I, was I mean, it's a really low-level player. It seems pretty similar to our yeah. stories before. Where we were talking about SAP, where they had kind of their own homegrown. Yeah. But it was like, eh, you know what? We might as well, at the 11th hour, just make a play for something that's yeah. big right now. This could be a similar situation in a sense, couldn't it? I mean, if they went with a WCM play, certainly. Yeah. The exact target isn't one. They didn't really claim yeah. to do uh, marketing automation, but it does a lot for them in terms of their way kind of wanting to be this one-stop shop, be able to, you know, there's certainly their focus has shifted from the CIO to the CMO, um, and, and, and Benioff is really betting on that. Yeah. The Keith Block hiring, though, is interesting. Um, what is that? Curious you know, I, I guess you know. Number one is he just is Benioff off just taking a stab at Ellison. You know, two big, huge egos going back and forth and taking Which each have, other's people. They've gone back and forth for quite some time. Absolutely. Too, so. But two is I don't know though. If you're a disruptor like Salesforce is, why do you go hire the head sales guy for the kind of anti-disrupting force in the in the market? Mm -hmm. I don't know if, if I mean I know nothing about Keith Block. I certainly don't know him personally. I don't really know much about his reputation. I know that Ellison did a lot. What was it? Six uh, maybe six or eight months ago when they missed earnings to go and blame sales. Remember, I think we even talked about that. Yeah. I mean, they, he really threw sales under the glass and, yeah. I, and I bet that, you know, that means block. But, um, you know, I don't know. Your big enterprise sale that you're selling, you know, selling Oracle is very different than the play in terms of coming in and managing an organization like Salesforce, which mm -hmm. is what he's being asked to do, and manage the sales of them. I know they want to push into the enterprise, certainly. Yeah. Do you hire... Oracle, uh, you know, head of sales to go do that. I'm not sure, sure that, but you know, I don't, I know nothing about him. I just think it's an interesting. It's just move. an interesting. Plan. It's not an obvious one for me. Yeah. But. Okay. All right. Now I'm going to get to the there piece that I wanted to go. talk about. Not necessarily wanted to, but I just jumped the gun a little bit. My apologies again. All right. So uh, another vendor making news this month, as I started talking about before, is in fact Ektron. They actually re uh, recently debuted version nine of its core product with a focus on personalization, which is what today's show is all about, and targeting two popular themes in digital marketing and mobile. That's what everybody is looking toward, every mo uh, marketer especially. In addition, Ektron, ready to boost its global sales and, and marketing programs and its mobile cloud offerings, thanks to infusion uh, of outside investment, the round of financing, the third in the company's 15-year history, brings a total outside funding to four and a half million dollars. Now, Actron has, has dozens of government contracts worth literally millions of dollars, but but a company spokesperson indicated the hacking incident wasn't any kind of uh, well systemic, systemic issue. What do you think about this? Because that's the one thing a lot of folks are okay. really thinking about. I'm gonna, I'm gonna not be the cynic on this one. I often am. I was gonna um, say, it's like you, put you know, a different I must screen. have gotten four, five text messages or DMs from others in the industry, basically saying, "Hey, others who you know represent other other products, saying, hey, did you see that you know Ektron got hacked?" And I basically said back to them, "Like, you should be thankful that it wasn't your product. Like, you should be thankful that this isn't your problem." I, you know. I would uh, beware of karma here for the other folks in the industry. I don't think that being hacked means that you're suddenly, uh, that that 
shows that you're a poor quality system, anything. I mean, hackers hack. That's what they do, you know? Um, and, and so they found some backdoor into it or whatever. I agree that it's not necessarily systemic, and I, and, and I think that you know, they'll, 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 they'll spot it and they'll fix it. Um, but I think they were unlucky to have been the target of it. Mm -hmm. And the fact that they were hosting a number of government you know, applications makes them a prime target for it. Who cares if you're not hosting you know, government information in this yep. day and age? Uh, that you, nobody wants to hack you. Um, so I think others should be happy that they weren't hacked, to be honest. But I don't, I don't think that is any sort of a, like, ooh, I wouldn't go with Ektron now because he's been hacked once. It just doesn't make and, any and sense. To that point, I mean, I mentioned the fact about, uh, you know, it was a government site. These are government contracts that a lot of uh, Ektron's, Ektron's, some of their bigger contracts are mm -hmm. with government contracts. Those are the types of sites that are going to be hacked and targeted, targeted. targeted. if you will, right? Targeted. I mean, so like you said, to your point, that could be literally be any single CMS vendor out there, WCM right. vendor out there that says, well, hey, if you want to deal in that sphere, in that right. actual space, you're going to get hacked yeah. one way or another because you're going to be, have a big old target on your back. You're going to get targeted, exactly. I mean, it's, you know, Plone is another, uh, it's an open source uh, tool, but, you know, very well known for its kind of security. Yeah. They really they really pride themselves in that. And we had something on maybe four or five months ago where, and I think they run CIA's website and a number of other, maybe Navy, I'm not sure, a, a number of other ones, and they got hacked as well for the first time. It, it, you know, so this happens, I think. Um, it's it, it says happen. nothing about Ektron. It just says... Too bad for them. Sorry, yeah, but, they were a target at one point. Yeah, but I don't, I don't want to foster the, fuel that fire. Yeah. On the on the positive side, though, yes, they raised some money. Many will look at it and go, "Ooh, what was the? Why did they have to go raise yep. cash?" And that's the buzz in the CMS world. But I think it's because they basically maybe they want to go, uh, you know, acquire. They haven't told me exactly what they want to do with mm -hmm. that money, but um, they basically they've been changing their business for a while, coming yep. out of services a little bit more, going into more product development. Um, so. That's fine. I've, I'm great with that. Anybody else would make that announcement, and we'd be happy for them. And, and then the third thing is they've just launched version nine, um, which is a which is a really nice you know, mm -hmm. mobile and the targeting and, and and kind of personas through the yep. course of that. Absolutely. It's a, it's a really nice release for them. Yeah, exactly. And personalization, and that's what today's topic of the show is all about. So we're going to go ahead and move on. That just kind of wraps up some of our news segments for today. So let, let's go ahead and let's let's talk about website personalization because that's what we're exploring on today's episode. Now. Uh, the value of personalization, whether individual visitors are treated as individuals with targeted content, uh, is indisputable. Here to talk about that a little bit more is going to be Tim Walters. You've, we've had him here on the show today, uh, had him on the show in prior episodes. This time, he's joining us in studio. Yes, he made the trip over, and he's joining us in studio in just a few seconds. But, you know, more conversions on your social channels, higher volumes of relevant traffic, more repeat visitors, happier customers in general. Like, I think that's what you know, people want, right? They want happier customers. So, of course, to talk a little bit more about that, we welcome Tim into the show of Digital Clarity Group. Tim, well, welcome in. How are you doing today? Thanks, Tyler. It's great. Uh, I was going to say, we've had you on the phone a handful of times right. now. You know, it's great to have you in our... In this luxurious studio. Luxurious <laughs> studio, exactly. That's the, the best way to put it's it. That CMS Connected budget we flew you know, over. They, they hand-paint every logo back here. <laughs> 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 I'm also a painter, folks. I'm also a painter. All right, so you know, one of the things I want to talk about, Tim, in particular, is you know, it seems like it's almost deja vu in a, a sense. We all remember uh, Broadvision, one-on-one -on -one marketing solution. I think it was like 99 when it actually happened. Personalization finally taking off. Everybody, every single marketer out there is talking about that. What took so long, it seemed, though, since 99? Because it seemed like it's been an ongoing thing. Talk about yeah. that a little bit. So, so let me begin by just clarifying the terms a little bit because people uh, often get confused about it. Um, we're going to be talking about personalization. So that means actually in one way or another altering, modifying, showing different kinds of content or, or some kind of content on a given website or a set of websites. In addition to that, you have customization. Uh, and that's the kind of thing you did with My Yahoo or typically associated with portals where an individual can determine that they want the page to look differently or, or so forth. All of us do that now on our, uh, on our Twitter home pages, for example, and put our own image behind it. That's customizing the Twitter website. Uh, and then there's a third one, which I guess you just call dedicated properties or targeted properties. So let's say you're a financial services firm. Uh, you might come to the home page of the portal, and then as soon as the site is able to determine, either by you signing in or through other actions, that you're, say, a, a high-wealth individual or something like that, they want you to go to that set, the set of sites that are dedicated to that kind of person. So you're not actually personalizing the content on the site. You've got a targeted set of sites 
for, for that particular group or, or segment. So we're really going to be talking about personalization in the first case where you're actually changing some of the content elements uh, on a website. So it is really interesting that it's finally taken this long. I happened to join the industry in uh, early 2000, mm -hmm. um, and, and when and Broad Vision One to One was uh, probably at its at its hot hot point or most famous. Uh, and 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 you know I worked for Fatwire. I spent a lot of time um, promoting personalized websites, you know, to no avail <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> through the early 2000s. <laughs> and um, uh, you know the the technologies have been there not exactly mature, but they've been there basically the entire time and now we're finally seeing that there's there's actually really uh, a great deal of interest in it and so forth from the uh, from the from the medium. So you know is it the same thing? Yes, the fundamental point is the same. We want to somehow uh, avoid showing one size web one size fits yeah, all websites definitely. which don't fit anybody yeah. um, you know but uh, you know, it's like saying, is the Telsa Roadster the same as the electric cars that Robert Anderson was building in Scotland in 1830, right? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, there, there's, a, there's an electric cell and it powers an electric motor, um, but the, you know, the technologies and the context are considerably different now than they were before. And I get asked this question all the time, so I'm going to turn around and ask you and see what you have to say about this. But then, so what are the kind of, what are some of the differences then between the circumstances now yeah. and the circumstances in 2000 when you were trying unsuccessfully to do yeah. personalization. Why yeah. Why should it be possible okay. today? Okay, okay. Well, I'd be interested to see what you have to say about that as well. I mean, there, <laughs> it's uh, back and forth there, are, um, there are some obvious ones, okay? So, you know, in, in 1999, 2000, and, and well after that, basically most people had dial-up modems. And it was unlikely that you were going to do heavy, personalized, dynamic websites with dial-up modems, yep. period. Yep. Uh, similarly, the other kind of infrastructural technological improvements or evolution. So, you know, broadband, faster chips, m much less expensive storage, yeah. much faster and, you know, more efficient integrations with the kinds of things like database, customer databases and CRMs that you would need in order to inform mm -hmm. the, your personalization mm -hmm. strategy and so mm -hmm. forth. So there, there are those things. Um, then there are the technological changes, I guess, at the presentation layer. So in, you know, at the beginning of the millennium, First of all, most a good percentage of people had custom-built websites, mm -hmm. or they had you know first-generation uh, WCMs, um, and those basically didn't have any personalization capabilities. If you wanted to personalize or yeah. add a campaign or change something, that was a coding exercise. That's right. That was time-consuming, expensive, and you just weren't going. It wasn't going to happen. Um, and and the fundamental one that that I I, I like to bring up is that. Um, you know, for a long time, and, and unfortunately, I think even still today, the web is basically, uh, to put it mildly, ignorant and stupid. Okay, <laughs> it, is, it is ignorant in the sense that it's unattentive. So virtually anything that a visitor does on the web is throwing off all these signals say, uh, that are declarations of what it is they're trying to accomplish or what they're interested in and what they're mm -hmm. trying to get at, mm -hmm. like a search term or yes. where they go immediately in the That's navigation right. from the home page, mm -hmm. or how long they take looking at a particular piece of content. The fact All that they this, don't actually land they, on the home page usually. They don't start there. They right. land someplace they land based someplace. on a search. And then they need to come back, right? right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But you know, if, if, you could listen to, if you could listen to these signals, they're, they're telling you directly what it is they're trying to accomplish, right. and most websites aren't incapable of hearing of any yeah. of this. Yeah. And then the reason I say it's stupid, if they are listening to it, they're not intelligent enough to react appropriately right, right, in right. real time to right. that, to, you know, and that's, I, I think that's still the case for most websites, but that's where the technological changes are taking place now. Yeah. Websites can um, economically be attentive and yeah. intelligent. Yeah. Right? Gotcha. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. So we, in a way, let's talk about, you know, the, the maturity, because I think one of the things that's interesting, we almost had to wait for, you know, technology and expectations to mature in a sense. Talk to that. Yeah. Yeah, so the other one that, that you're absolutely right, the, the other one that we want to bring up in terms of what's changed in the last, say, 15 years is that, um, you know, that, that what do we call them? Um, <laughs> content consumers, digital, digital um, um, visitors are much more demanding and less tolerant of unusual and aberrant experiences online. So, you know, 15 years ago, it, the web was very new and it, it, it was expected or it was accepted that you could have, let's say, not only a different but a lower quality experience on a website than you would in in a in a face to face encounter or something like that, and that tolerance has disappeared as well. Uh, so the 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 um, 
uh, the technologies in a certain way have to improve in order to catch up with that uh, uh, consumer expectation. So I, I think that there's one very significant thing here that, that we haven't talked about and because it doesn't have anything to do with technology. And that is this you know, now well-established and also very, very popular among marketers um, discussion of inside out versus outside in. Mm -hmm. And those, um, those early um, tools like the broad vision and the things that were available, you know, say into the mid 2000s, um, were about, and I'm going to come back to, I think, later, whether were is the right uh, <laughs> verb tense here, um, were about um, making the website more um, persuasive. That is, trying to get people, it was trying to actually influence behavior. That's the way we actually talked about it. You know, how can we, one, attract people to our site, and then how can we increase the number of them that do exactly what we want them to do? That is, buy something, or sign up, or whatever it is. And, and um, we talked about, you know, it, it, personalization in that, in that sense is, is pretty much manipulation, right? Yeah. We increase the ability to manipulate by showing a, uh, you know, a retired person a different kind of description for data surfaces on their phone than you would a college student because, the, you know, you have to appeal to them in different ways. But the goal is actually to convert both of them, mm -hmm. right, as, as quickly and as efficiently as possible. And to in order to avoid outright calling it manipulation, marketers like myself at the time had to invent another term, so we, came, we called it persuasion. Right? And, and there was actually this established kind of rhetoric yes. about persuasive content management. Yes. I think that we were responsible for getting Forrester to start talking about that in the <laughs> early 2000s. I'm pretty sure that came so from one of my pitches. all <laughs> Tim Walters doing. You basically <laughs> yes. created I'm, the idea. I'm, just, of I'm single handedly then you responsible went to for, and for writing personal writing. If you're having a good experience <laughs> online, thanks to me. Any problem with um, persuasive content? Right? And so, <laughs> And so the difference now is that, um, that you, we're looking at it from an outside-in perspective, or, or we should be, uh, and it's not about trying to get the visitor to do what we want them to do, but trying to recognize what it is that they are trying to achieve and support that as well as possible, therefore to increasing the overall quality of their experience and therefore making it more likely that they're going to continue to rely upon us for that support in the future. Yeah, I think, so now how about, so there's the kind of consumer empowerment theory, what they're looking for, there is the uh, aspect of um, kind of our readiness to listen to them. Um, the part that you talked about where you said, I think you said stupid, is that people are not ready to then actually respond with content. So kind of, are we in that, are we in a better state there? Is that basically the state of the marketer today? Is that this, does it have anything to do with technology? The whole kind of once you are listening, if yeah. the technology is there, are we ready, ready to respond today? Is that happening? Are we ready to respond? Um, I, I, well, certainly there's a willingness to respond. Yeah, I just yeah. saw a statistic a couple of days ago that said, uh, I think Bloomberg um, did a, uh, an analysis and 79% or 76% of the marketers said that they intend to invest in personalization technologies mm -hmm. and processes mm -hmm. uh, in the short term, mm -hmm. right? So let's say in the next 12 months or something like that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's, that's the entire premise yeah. from Tyler, that it really is catching on now. Uh, however, on the other hand, one of the things that we constantly hear in our interactions with, with clients and end users is that, um, in, in the, again, in this context of customer in, experience management, mm -hmm. Uh, and in particular, trying to make sure that you're presenting the, the relevant content to someone yes. at, a, at a particular point in their buying consideration or whatever, you have to produce a lot more content, right? right? Yeah. And that's, the, that's probably the number one objection from organizations is that they just don't, you know, they, they recognize that this is going to take, you're not producing content for one website, which is hard enough, but you're producing it for 10 variations or say six variations of that Right. plus recognizing every different point in the customer journey, plus, of course, the multi-channel considerations, and the volume of stuff that you have to produce actually increases dramatically, and a lot of organizations just don't understand how they're going to do it. There were about 10 chief marketing officers that just blew their brains out. <laughs> I was going to say, they said, so right. wait a minute, all these channels, all these pieces, and different steps along the way, right. how do I actually that, that that's really, yeah. <laughs> um, And it, as a matter of fact, this is, this is, again, one of the things that's driving the increased... Um, frequency of, uh, of partnering with some kind of, of, of service provider, whether yeah. it's a digital agency, or in this case, it probably would be a digital agency, or simply a content production partner, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? So that they can outsource the production of that very high volume of content. And the, one of the interesting things about it is that 
um, from the perspective of the organization, increasing the relevance of, uh, of an experience means um, producing much, much more content. Yeah. From the perspective of any individual um, consumer that you're trying to interact with, relevance means presenting much, much less content, yeah. <laughs> right? Because you're trying to shave off the irrelevant noise and, exactly. and filter it, or focus your attention on precisely what it is that's going to best support their, their task orientation. Yeah, I wonder what you think about, I think one of the things that also kind of makes the lay of the land today more kind of appropriate for this is, you know, we're talking an awful lot more now about content marketing. You know, our colleague Robert Rose is one of the uh, principal folks pushing this, th this thought, and many are. It's, it's that the idea of just creating marketing content is kind of almost the wrong paradigm right. th way of thinking about it from the very beginning. Right. The outside-in approach that you talked about basically says, what is it that our audience is looking for and how can we basically participate yeah. in that conversation, become relevant to them, become a source of information. And so oftentimes, I mean, we just, just seconds ago, and this is less question, I guess, and more crosstalk, but we talked mm -hmm. about the alfresco aquia thing, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And we basically said that they realized that, you know, some of that content they're sitting on, that organizations are sitting on, documents and stuff start to become relevant. Basically, all of your content is now marketing content yeah. because all of it is, 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 beneficial to some part of your audience, right, in some yeah. way. Yeah. I, I mean, does, do you think that the, the aspect of content marketing and just kind of that notion of having to create web content for the purposes of it, folks should maybe look at it a little bit, yeah. a little bit differently? Maybe it's yeah. not such a big imposition. Yeah. It is, it, well, yes, they, they should look at it differently, whether yeah. or not it's a, a, it a, is an imposition, it's, it's an imposition from a workload perspective, yeah, yeah. one way or the other. But you're right, they should look at it differently, and certainly you're right that at least potentially uh, uh, some significant amount of the uh, unstructured content that you've got in your in sure. your repositories could be uh, relevant and useful, and and, and you're, you know you're right also in that in the previous paradigm, um, producing marketing content means hiring a talented writer who can um, come up with an engaging description of product or right. engaging description of a you know engaging copy, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, and in the in the second sense where you're trying to be relevant for particular customer task orientations and segmentations, right. um, you need to constantly be thinking about them. Haha. Yes. <laughs> Think about the customer. All right. So <laughs> you you know you know we're supposed to do that? can you imagine? <laughs> um, you know, researching, building personas right. and always directing your uh, di directing your understanding of what content is, ought to be presented at a particular point by those persona considerations and the, and the expectations and requirements yeah. that those define. And then it's entirely possible, although we don't know for sure in a given context, that, s that some of the content in the corporate repositories that's been sitting there kind mm -hmm. of, mm -hmm. you know, without being exactly. able to really extract a lot of value out of it, yeah. out of it is in one way or another going to become valuable. Perhaps not directly as the content that I yeah, present, exactly. but the content, the information that I draw on about right. past transactions, profiles, interactions with the call center, yeah. in order to sharpen the relevance for that particular that How do you start to customer. hand the reins to others in the organization, a product manager, a developer, whatever other folks that people want to hear from as well, who might want right. to start blogs and those sorts of things to kind of talk about what they're doing right. and I provide their expertise. One of the best things I've actually heard from someone is, you know, the conversations that your sales professionals are actually having. Yeah. That's some of your best content right there, exactly. right? I mean, yeah. at the end of the day, they're the ones that are actually the telling better. the story yeah. because they are talking to those people one exactly. at a time. Exactly. Well, the marketers would like to think that we do sometimes. They're almost responsible but. to sharpen the best particular story. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's going to resonate with the needs of the uh, of the of the prospect, at least. Yeah, definitely. So I know we've only got a, a few minutes left. The last thing I wanted to ask you about was, was privacy concerns. Yeah. I know. I mean, this is kind of a, a bigger question, but yeah. does this open the door for some privacy concerns? It certainly opens the door. Yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, lots of doors lead to privacy concerns yeah, today. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, if, you know, in principle, we've said that you, you want to have uh, the best informed decisions about what you're going to be presenting to a particular visitor at a particular time, mm -hmm. that information means that you're learning as much as you can about them and their needs, uh, and therefore, potentially at least, you're, you're learning things about them that they might not want you to know. Right? or that they did not explicitly give you or, or something, or they haven't been told that you're collecting, and so on and so forth. However, it, it, it's interesting um, that I, I think there's a trend. I mean, I've seen a number of good data points, and I, and I think there's a trend that, for example, 
uh, in a survey in the UK just last year, so this is recent, 74% of the uh, consumers said that they would respond pro positively to companies who understood them. And understood them was defined precisely here as taking to, into account my preferences, my purchase histories, and so forth. In other words, becoming more relevant. Mm -hmm. right? So it definitely has to be a trade-off uh, if, um, if it is gathering or exploiting my data just for the sake of you know, selling it somewhere. That's obviously problematic. But here, consumers are increasingly saying, if it's improving my experience, I'm willing to, in other words, buy a more relevant and richer experience with my data. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and there was another kind of funny study um, about what kind of data are you willing to give up. I think this one was U U.S. based or North American based. And so people said, you know, my political affiliation, that's not, that's okay. Um, my, maybe my income, my demograph basic demographical information, my past purchase histories. Um, but the one thing that they were very, not one of the things, but one thing very low on the list that they were not, they were very re reluctant to give up was their precise geolocation via their smartphone. Uh, and this is curious because that's like the easiest thing to find yeah, out, yeah, it's yeah. and it's and it's virtually impossible to avoid, yeah. right? But it ranked it ranked like only 15% were willing to give up that information. It was e equal. It was co-equal in the in the survey with um, the precise number of sexual partners they've ever had, right? <laughs> and they, that was it. My geolocation on my smartphone was just was as sensitive just as, as that, sensitive. right? <laughs> but at the same point, you almost start to think, Tim, is that. The users are actually starting to use this, you know, data for their data is currency yeah. in a sense, yeah, right? Absolutely. That's I mean, the way it should be. Yeah. I mean, that, that, that would be nice if that's the way it went. Yeah. So that this kind of trade-off became something that was, um, that was virtually in real time. Like, yeah. how much are you willing to give me in order to benefit from mm -hmm. this service or dri literally drive down the cost, yeah, right? Yeah. Or something yeah. like yeah, that. Exactly. I, I, I doubt that that's the way it's going to go, yeah. um, but <laughs> it would be nice. It yeah. would be nice. Tim, yeah. honestly. Absolute pleasure. We, we've had you out a couple times now, Great. but Thank continuing you. on, appreciate you taking time out and jumping on the show. Okay, today. thanks. Here's Tim Walters of Digital Clarity Group. I'm Tyler Pyburn of the Pulse Network. We are going to take a very quick commercial break. We're going to be having In the Spotlight in just a few seconds with Open Text. Don't go anywhere. Businesses today demand a powerful web content management and online marketing platform that can provide the best value at an affordable price with unlimited website possibilities. Kentico. The .NET Enterprise Marketing Solution and Web Content Management Platform of Choice powers more than 12,000 websites in over 84 countries, which means you get a stable, well-tested solution. Fully loaded with over 350 web parts and controls and more than 80 extensible modules. Kentico provides you with a fully integrated solution for building your online presence and running successful online marketing campaigns. It allows you to quickly launch an effective B2B or B2C site, intranet, online store, or branded online community, fully integrated with Facebook and Twitter. Organizations need to be more effective at catering to the personalities of their site visitors and the way they consume information. Sites need to more dynamically adjust to each site visitor to optimize their experience. Kentico EMS delivers a complete customer experience management platform that provides all of the necessary capabilities for interactive marketing, from planning and conception, through optimization and execution, and lastly, analysis. Gain the insight required to analyze your marketing performance, align the content, execution, and analytics critical for successful interactive campaigns, speeding delivery, and optimizing return on investment. With a fully integrated set of online marketing tools, Kentico EMS can improve your online marketing efforts, which allows you to focus on what's important, making your business successful. Test drive Kentico EMS today to get a complete appreciation of all its powerful features and capabilities. All right, everyone, welcome back into CMS Connected. Big thanks again, as always, to Tim Walters joining us on the show. First time having him in studio, absolute pleasure indeed. But now it's time for In the Spotlight. In today's In the Spotlight, we're actually going to be reviewing OpenText WEM platform, formerly known as Vignette. Now, OpenText, enterprise software company and a leader in enterprise content management, brings two decades of expertise supporting 50 million users in 114 countries. 
2009 Open Text acquired Vignette, which has been rebranded under the Open Text name. Now, the former Vignette products uh, can be grouped into two broad categories: customer experience management and transactional content management. And of course, in the studio to help break down Open Text and well, the platform formerly known as Vignette. It almost sounds like something for prints, really, doesn't it? <laughs> well, we welcome back into the show Seth Gottlieb uh, of Lionbridge. Welcome in, Seth. How are you doing today? Thank you. Thank I was going to say, we, we were talking earlier, you know, you're kind of the, you know, the recurring guest from Saturday Night Live in a sense, right? We're, we need the smoking jacket. I, I know. Right? I feel like I, is there, is there any, actually, uh, this, yeah. I'll take this as the uh, smoking jacket. That, I think yeah. it is the smoking <laughs> jacket at this point yeah. in time. So, all right, so we'll let's start, talk about a vignette, or the formerly, the platform formerly known as vignette. I know, they should rename it as a symbol, I think. It yeah. Is, that's the new, new, Except new, that was new just name. A few it's squigglies. unpronounceable. Yeah, we'll be good yeah to exactly. Go. It's practically yeah. unpronounceable, yeah. web experience management. Um, but anyway, uh, so as you were saying, this is a product that's been on the market for a really long time. It's, um, it's actually the first uh, commercial, public, uh, commercial CMS that I implemented um, back in, in the 90s. But uh, they were formerly the CNET, the, the, the platform that ran CNET, which is the, pro, uh, the, the uh, very popular tech website. Yeah. So, um, and then they commercialized it. And they've just been uh, in the marketplace for a really long time. And they invented the term content management system. That was the first system that called itself content management. So uh, over the years, they've been dominant in media entertainment and also in uh, financial services. They got into portals uh, in a big way for a period of time. And um, then they got acquired in, in 2009 by uh, OpenText. Now, um, just, just a couple things. Like uh, prior to the acquisition of OpenText, they were kind of lost. Like, no one really knew where they're going. It didn't seem like they were no. They knew where they were going. They um, went into different markets. They just weren't quite sure what they were doing. And then also they had three different technology platforms. They started in a Unix scripting language called Tickle, which that was fun to <laughs> fun to say. I was a Tickle developer. Um, and then uh, went to .NET, and then went to to Java. But at the end of the day, I mean, I think that what the product is at the the very core is just a very mature platform that doesn't have a lot of the technical baggage that happens with other mature products because it's been re-architected for a couple times. Uh, from within OpenText, I mean, it fits a critical component in their whole uh, customer experience management. So it's kind of the hub of like how, how you uh, choreograph the customer experiences that, that, that you have on your digital presences. Um, it kind of bumped off uh, Red Dot a little bit, which is their other content yep. management system. Um, although they kind of have a nice uh, line in the sand between like Java and .NET, but yep. you know I would say that that's getting the most attention. So one of the things I wanted to ask you in particular about is you know, clearly it, it's been around. Yep. I mean they are a pioneer, you know, yep. pioneer, oh pioneer. But in 09, after being acquired, you know, we didn't hear very much about it. Talk to that a little bit more. I'm curious to know more about what they've really done, what Open Text has done since yeah, 09, yeah. since they've yeah, acquired so them. I think everybody has been really curious about like what would happen with Vignette because uh, historically Open Text is not uh, you know not known for web content management. They're like document management, archival, digital asset management, and you know we, so we were all kind of waiting like what what was going to happen. And this is this is kind of the revealing, the unveiling of of that of that commitment. And and uh, so 8.5 just got released. Uh, it's the largest release since it's been under Open Text. And I got to say, I was very impressed. I was kind of surprised to be uh, as impressed as I was because, you know, I didn't, I didn't really have any <laughs> expectations. Have and I was just, but I, bar, yeah, I, I felt like I was right. waiting for so long and then I kind of, uh, you know, lost attention. But I saw the product and uh, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty impressive. I think there are a couple areas that they improved a lot on. Uh, the first is usability. Um, I think that a lot of products in that class have this tendency to just bombard the user with all sorts of features that they, you know, don't really need. And and uh, while it ha it's very feature rich, the product, um, it it the the user interface is pretty clean and it doesn't mm -hmm. seem to distract you, especially the uh, in context editing interface. Um, but probably the biggest area that um, that they're focusing on is actually two of them. One is responsive. Uh, design, yep. and they support that very well with, uh, first of all, by using modern frameworks like Bootstrap for their samples and their components, and um, second of all, their, all their editing, in-context editing uh, experiences allow you to kind of edit as, you know, from within the view that a mobile user might use or a, a tablet user might use. So you can kind of size the browser 
to how big your, um, you know, your viewport might be, and then edit things like your titles and make sure they don't wrap awkwardly and then make it big again to see what it looks like in the desktop. And the third area, which I think dovetails very well with what Tim was talking about, is the uh, personalization. Yeah. Um, they have done a lot of work with uh, audience segmentation. So uh, you can hook into uh, Facebook profiles. And I think the really interesting thing is you can hook into uh, current weather conditions with the visitors. Oh, really? Yeah, so you know, so you I, I'm trying to think of what, what could I, I do with that? Should I show a sunny, uh, a, a sunny picture for someone who's experienced rain, or should I s empathize with them and show a little so, rain? So let me ask you that. To, to that effect, you know, what type of companies should be utilizing this platform? In a sense? Because I think, I mean, that's all well and good, but I mean, if you're a B2B company and you've got to, you know, yeah. hey, it's going to be 70 out tomorrow, I mean, th does this work for them? I, I think, well, just like with any mature, uh, rich, and, and capable product, you have to figure out like what you need. Rather than say, yeah. oh, I can do weather targeting, you, yeah. you don't, like I got to do weather targeting. Um, but I think that, um, well, certainly brand companies would, would benefit from that, where you're trying to uh, position brands or products uh, to what a customer might be interested in. Um, and uh, you know, they have a lot of experience in financial, you know, so again, kind of a product company type of thing. Yeah. They don't do a lot with e-commerce. They partner with uh, Elastic, uh, Elastic Path um, to do uh, e-commerce. So you know, I would look into that bef you know, before getting into that. But you know, uh, that integration might be very good. I didn't dig into that very much. Mm -hmm. um, a couple other uh, features. One is they have a cloud offering, which is really just managed hosting. It's not yeah. kind of like uh, Amazon Web Services cloud, but they use their EasyLink data centers to do uh, hosting for, for companies that don't want to run it on their data centers, which is very appealing. For companies that are just out, they have a very locked down corporate data center yeah. and they want to have something kind of off the campus for their, uh, their, their website. And then lastly is just integration with all the open, uh, other open text products. Interesting. You know, um, Media Manager, which is their digital yep. asset management system, yep. their archival system. Absolutely. So, you know, in a nutshell, in kind of closing, to, to wrap it up, if I was Caesar and I was giving the, the thumb up or down, which way would we actually be going with it? <laughs> I, I, would, I would definitely give it a thumbs up. I mean, I, okay. I, was, I was pretty impressed uh, with the product. I think the big gap, which I didn't get to, is in analytics. Because I feel like if you have personalization without analytics, um, you know, the, the analytics isn't that strong. So if you are saying, oh, we're going to use weather for targeting, how do you know whether it's working or not? So I think that analytics is something you'd have to bring in from someplace else. Okay. Excellent. Great stuff. So the, the, the last question remains, Scott. I mean, we've talked about open text a couple times now as far as, you know, Kevin Cocker coming over from uh, Adobe. We've talked about Vignette as well, obviously. You know, we're talking specifically about that now. Sure. Talk about from the, the business side uh, of open text, your, your kind of thoughts. Sure. And I said this the last time, but, you know, since we're focused here specifically on it again, I think it's important to note that, you know, uh, Seth gave the kind of history of kind of where they've gone with products, and a lot of that has to do with where they've come as a company and the, and the, and the strategy that they've taken. They were explicitly outright and open about the fact that they were in acquisition mode at, at, the cert, at, a, at a current, at a particular state of a product life cycle to basically go and reap the, you know, their, their focus on getting profit was through reaping the maintenance uh, revenue from, from products that they acquired at a certain stage in their life cycle, essentially. That was explicitly what they were trying to do. Now, I think the new CEO has come in and basically said, I want to take a completely new approach. He's been on for about a year now and said that I want to figure out which parts of our portfolio do we want to sunset, which parts do we want to accelerate with, how can we make these work a little bit better. He brings in somebody like Kevin and others on the executive team now that have a history of being able to bring these sorts of products together. So um, it's no, uh, and, and oh, by the way, what, we've, what, what Seth is reviewing has been underway for the last two and a half years of incubation. So even before the new CEO came on, they were always going to do something with Vignette. He can't get all the credit, but I think we're really seeing OpenText trying to reinvent itself in terms of um, its portrayal in the industry. Would you agree? I mean, that was basic. That was I, the. I totally agree. It, it was like yeah. that was what OpenText was. It was like, oh, what are they going to buy now? And they're going to sit on it. And, oh, too bad. Now it's going to yeah. die. Oracle is now where you go to die, and but not OpenText. Um, <laughs> sorry. Oh, you said you were being today. Yeah, I don't know. It's, it's, it's just it's hard. Look, it's it's hard not to. I'll get the emails. But um, so I think I, I like what they've done with this. You know, they they where they put this in terms of what they call EIM, their enterprise information management, is their thing. I still I continue to tell them I don't love that name, Marcy. But you know, and Kevin, I don't love the name. But um, 
I, I think the idea that what we talked about earlier, even with, again, we've referenced this Alfresco and Acquia um, partnership a number of times, but they have the capacity at OpenText to take a lot of that information that's sitting inside your organization because they have ECM and, 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 and uh, document management systems mm -hmm. in place. They have, they bought Enstein years back, which is a great semantic search tool. They've got a number of other things that are sitting on inside the organization that they can now tap into, that if they do fully dedicate themselves to the CEM experience, it's tapping into a lot of that unstructured content and information they can start to bring to fruition. So I like what they're doing, to be honest Excellent. with you. Love it. Great stuff. That right there, in the spotlight with open text indeed. Seth, love your help. Appreciate it, as always, my friend. Thank you. Great stuff. That right there, Seth Gottlieb of Lionbridge. That was in the spotlight with open text. Now it is, in fact, time to go ahead. We're going to move on, and we're going to be talking all about rapid fire. Yes, that's right. We put about a, roughly a minute on the clock. And we let, well, Scott have some fun. We go through a handful of different stories, six to be exact today. We've got a, a couple of fun ones as well. So, Scott, we're ready for this. Good to go? I, I am, and this time I'm going to watch the clock. I think the first one last <laughs> time I completely forgot I was on the clock. Much worse things have happened. It's all right, though. So the very first thing we're going to be talking about is patent pending. Put yeah. a minute on the clock for this. Percussion has just introduced a patent pending feature that enables a marketer to take existing website, uh, migrate it to Percussion CMS, and essentially be up and running in hours. And this feature is now called Live First. Talk about patent pending. Sure. So Live First is um, so something that Forced, sorry, that Percussion has uh, recently launched. They've been working on it for quite some time, and I've seen it a number of times in person. Um, it's essentially the way they, they actually were talking, contemplating about calling it Site Sucker, which is the idea that you can go to any website from the outside, from, you know, from just from the internet, having no exposure to the back end, and being able to pull in not only all of the content that's exposed to you through the internet, but also be able to essentially refactor and recreate templates to be able to go and populate, repopulate in the Percussion CM1 platform. So um, it's not just this idea of sucking out content, which many do, but populate it back within context of templates is the really interesting thing to me. Somebody said to me that, uh, like, isn't this the same old thing? And I think, no, it's not. Um, that said, can it be an ultra complex site that it, pop that it sucks? No, not necessarily, because um, the idea of personalization, if you don't have access to all the content at the same time through the front end, you're going to leave some behind. But I think it's a really awesome uh, thing for certain types of sites. Let, let's talk about numbers. Let's talk about SDL. Now, you know, they had some uh, interesting numbers come out. Profits will only be between 50 and 60 percent of what uh, markets expected this year. And with uh, SDL, the, the plunging right now a little bit as far as the, their stocks are concerned. Talk to that, uh, you know, acquisition hawks. Are they kind of gathering for an acquisition of SDL? Yeah, so... Um so I was actually just at, at uh, Innovate and speaking with Mark Lancaster, who's the, the CEO there uh, at their, at their um, customer um, event uh, last week or the week before, um, and talked to him about this. He, you know, he very much knows about some of the, the pains that they've basically had in, the, in, the, in sales, uh, even in marketing. Um, I think the good news here, first of all, this is a big blow to them. To miss targets by 50 to 60% is no small, uh, it's very difficult. Um, but I think the challenge here for them, the good news is that the challenge is re really on the people side. It's on how can you get sales to be motivated in different ways. Maybe it's about incentives for them. Maybe the marketing, they've just brought on a new uh, CMO for the first time at the group level, which is good. So I think they're making the right moves. The good news is that it's not the product. The product is highly praised in all the MQs and all of the waves and whatever else. It's a great product. I think uh, this is a fixable problem. But nonetheless, are they open for acquisition? I think definitely. Maybe it's an SAP that we talked about before. I don't know. Um, but for sure, it puts them on a hot plate. Well, let's move on. Let's talk about security breaches. We obviously talked about this a little bit earlier with Ektron, but now let, let's move on to more from the open source side with, uh, as far as Drupal is concerned. Now, an email sent out to members of, uh, of Drupal.org and groups Drupal.org, uh, Holly Ross, you know, the association executive director, has advised that a security breach has been uh, exposed in the personnel, uh, personal information of those registered for these sites. Now, information uh, exposed includes personal information such as usernames, passwords, uh, country information, et cetera, et cetera. Scott, you know, right now looking at this, is there a major problem uh, propri proprietary software vendors uh, have been warning us about uh, as far as regards to open source technology? I mean, is this the issue that people have been kind of saying, hey, it's coming, it's here, is this the issue right now? 
I'm not going to be the perpetrator of FUD necessarily here, where I do not think this is an open source issue. Once again, we just talked about, it's a hard question, it's an easy question to answer when we just got talking about Ektron, very much proprietary software be also being hacked. Um, this happens, and as a matter of fact, they were the target because they have such a large community, quite frankly, there's an awful lot of information to go after and get from there. I think if anything, there's plenty to say about some downsides of open source. You know, security breaches is not necessarily one of them, and certainly um, in, a, in an environment like Drupal, where they have some pretty, you know, pretty controlled releases, there's plenty that can be done where, uh, you know, on an individual installation where you can open yourself up for security leak. But that's the same happens in proprietary. But I think, um, you know, they've they've taken the right steps here. Um, as a matter of fact, because of the way that they've um, secured the data, much of it is not actually going to even be exposed. Is just basically telling people to change their passwords. I don't think this is a huge deal. It's certainly not a sign of what's to, what's to fail with open source. So um, yeah, it's a problem, but it's not an open source problem. So one of the CMSs that we have yet to talk about is Crafter. Let's talk about the new kid on the block. New kids on the block, I just said that right now. But the new CMS in town right now, let's talk about Crafter. Scott, what do you know about them? We actually mentioned them a little bit early in the show, but give us a little bit more background. Yeah, I alluded to them earlier. This is um, a spin-off now of uh, Rivet Logic, and um, I've, I've, unfortunately I forget his name now. We just spoke last week or two weeks ago. Um, the CEO is the same CEO of Rivet Logic. He'll continue to control both companies for now, but they are in fact a, sp a spin-off with a separate, uh, you know, it's a separate company completely. Um, essentially, they've built off of the Alfresco platform. So this was Rivet Logic and Alfresco has got, had gone to market together for a while. When again, Alfresco pulled themselves out of the WCM space and said, "We're going to focus on the engine," and uh, Rivet Logic was a big partner of theirs that built a number of components and capabilities on top of the Alfresco platform, leveraging Alfresco for its things like workflow and uh, version control and those sorts of things, and building on top of that the kind of the web content management capabilities. So Crafter um, is just basically them productizing that and getting some good traction in the market to be able to go off and, and sell it as a product. And uh, basically, any services company looking for products is no problem of mine, and I, I understand it explicitly. So um, I think it's a, it's a neat new tool they've got. And while it's new, I know I'm over time, but while it is new, I think the, actually the, the product has been around for a while, just not with that name in, in Rivet Logic. So it's interesting. All right, let's move on. Let's talk about something that I think is interesting for, from your side point of view is Analyze the Analyst right here. Uh, on June 6th, 6th, Michael Assad from Agility wrote a post on the CMS Report website called Analyzing the CMS Analyst. Which one is right for you? Scott, what was your take on his post? Um, well, seeing that um, you know Michael is obviously very smart because Digital Clarity Group came out kind of on top of that where he recommended <laughs> us most of the four. I think it was uh, Forrester, Real Story Group, us, and uh, Ars Logica. No, I, I think it was a great article. For somebody to go and look at kind of analyzing the analysts, uh, which by the way, my former company, Outsell, has actually a, a report that they put out um, this once a year that's for a fee. But to, for somebody to kind of go and say, hey, let's look at who is doing all of this judging and how do they go about it and what are their incentives and all that to kind of explain that I was happy to have that conversation with him. Um, I think it's good to provide that level of transparency. We always try to do that. You know, questions were around like, do you work with vendors, and how do you work with vendors, and how do you serve the, you know, the buyer market, and in what ways. And while I didn't love the kind of rationale ultimately for why he kind of we we edged out on top, um, it was kind of more personal. But um, I did love the comments of it. I think there were like 30 comments or so last time I looked. Um, where we were get, there was an awful lot of kudos that we got, but folks provided a lot more information in the comments. So I think you'll see things like that come, you know, a lot more of that. I think you'll see a lot more of that sort of a, of a focus. Excellent. The very last one we want to touch upon is Think Together. Now, on May 30th, Carol Dover wrote an interesting post on the Digital Clarity Group website on thinking together with your customers. Now, I'm going to go ahead and re read this quote directly from the post saying, CRM, DM, CEM, CX, the labels change, but the message is clear. It's essential to engage your customers. Unfortunately, engagement is still largely defined around messages directed at the customer. And while methods are evolving, the messages still seem to be guided by the flawed assumption that you can control customers' choices if you just find the right button to push. Carl believes that you know, the company should significantly uh, improve brand value and customer loyalty, which I think we all agree. 
Scott, talk to this post a little bit, because it was a great post. Sure. Um, I do think it was a great post by Kyle, and it's kind of, he's, frankly, I've worked with Kyle for more than 10 years, and viewpoint selling has always been something that he's talked about, which is the idea of selling not from yourself, not from inside out, but from outside in, essentially, from the customer's view. So I think it's a good way to also uh, recap this show, where we talked about personalization today and some of what Tim brought in and talked about in terms of the kind of the empowered consumer. Kyle mentions three things um, specifically in this article that um, you need to expose yourself to is, number one, it's listen from the customer's viewpoint. So when you're talking, put it in their context. What is it that, why are they interested in you in the first place, and why should they want to kind of hear, hear about you? Second, allow them to decide what's compelling, meaning, um, so your emphasis, what you do, we even had this conversation in, internally today about the products that we put out. Some don't necessarily hit the mark and they don't resonate with our customers. So how can you make sure that you are, uh, in fact, being responsive and compelling to your audience? And then number three um, is sourcing conflict. So the idea of the empowered consumer, allow them to give you feedback and be able to react on that. It is as important, if not more so, um, than the kudos that you might get in something like comments or ratings or that sort of thing. So basically open yourself up. I mean, those companies today, and this is just to kind of recap for us, but you know, companies today I used to say that those who view the empowered consumer phenomenon as an opportunity would win. Now I say those who don't view it as an opportunity will die. So close yourself up and kind of stay within your old world if you want to, but you won't be around for long. Excellent. I love it. Great show as always today, my friend, wasn't it? It was fun, man. Excellent. Well, we've got one last announcement yeah. before we go ahead. We've got one last to let folks know is actually this is going to be my last episode here on CMS Connected. I'm actually riding into the sunset, actually t taking on new opportunities for both myself as well as my family, which would ho hopefully turn out to be great. But you know what, Scott, i got to tell you, it's honestly been an absolute pleasure over the course of the, the last couple of years, yeah. not only being on the show, getting to know you, getting to know the entire team. And uh, it's been awesome. It really has. You, you, you've you been great. It's amazing how you came into this, like basically knowing nothing about this space. You were just <laughs> a pretty face and a talking head. And now, uh, now I'm still a talking head and I don't look still, that good nah, You're a pretty face. <laughs> you're all right. I, I give it to you. But now I've learned a ton from you and it's been awesome. Working yeah, with you, really. it's been absolute great. And you know, I, I got to say thank you to obviously to Scott, but also to Digital Clarity Group for helping put on the show on, as well as Falcon Software, Gary, the entire team over at Falcon, for putting this show on. And of course, to the producers, the guys out back, for never say any of those guys' names because that's someone else's <laughs> style to go ahead and do that. However, just so you guys are aware, Butch Stearns is actually going to be taking over in my seat. He's here with the Pulse Network. Butch has a lot of history as far as being in front of the camera, a lot more than I do, and I actually learned everything from him. Some of the bad habits, too. So you'll have some of those as well. Jumping ahead and stupid jokes. Those will all be still here on CMS Connected. <laughs> I promise you that. But Butch will be in the, uh, the seat coming around next month here on CMS Connected. So for Scott, for Seth, for Tim, I'd like to say thank you all so much for joining us on another edition of CMS Connected. And a big thanks to our sponsors for making this show happen, Falcon Software, as well as Digital Clarity Group. I'm Tyler Pyburn of the Pulse Network. Not necessarily saying goodbye, but, well, see you next time. Have a good one, guys. <laughs>